Hello and welcome to another IGCSE biology video. Joining us today is Afreen. Over to Afreen. Okay, hello everyone. So today we're doing another episode of IGCSE biology and we're going to discuss chapter 14 that is coordination and response. Uh, okay, so here's the presentation. So this chapter has about five parts, I think. So let's get into that. Okay, so this is the syllabus, and the, this is the first part of the syllabus, and basically says, it you're, discusses about how you're supposed to know about the electrical impulses and the different parts of that, our nervous system and the roles of the various parts of our nervous system and, you know, the different mechanisms such as the reflex arc, the pupil reflex uh, functions, and wait, you don't have pupil reflex in this part yet. You have the synapses, and that's about it. So if you're doing the core part of the syllabus, you basically just need to know what is a syllabus. However, if you're going for the extended part of the syllabus, the supplement part, you need to know about the actual process that's happening at the synapse uh, and then the different uh, effects it has on your body and how different things can affect the functions of the synapse. So for the introduction, this is the very first part of your syllabus. First of all, you need to be able to state that electrical impulses travel along neurons. So this could come as a one mark question for you. So you basically just have to make this statement, electrical impulses travel along neurons. And then you need to know the two parts of the central, the nervous system, that is the central nervous system. And this consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And these are the areas of coordination. So these, this is the, think of it as the control center for your nervous system, that's the brain and the spinal cord. And then there's peripheral nervous system, and this is the nerves and the neurons, and this part of the nervous system coordinate and regulate bodily functions. So you'll see how that, that happens further along the chapter, but for now you need to know the two parts of the nervous system, that's the central and the peripheral. The central consists of your brain and the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system con consists of nerves and neurons, okay? And then you need to know what are involuntary actions and what are voluntary actions. So voluntary actions are actions that are not under conscious control and voluntary actions are the exact opposite of that. So it's like something you think, you consciously decide to do and you carry them out. And then you need to know what is a nerve impulse. A nerve impulse is an electrical signal that passes along nerve cells called neurons. So nerve cells are called neurons and electrical signals or electrical impulses like we discussed earlier, passes along nerve cells. These are called nerve impulses, okay? Then you need to know about the types of neurons. Once again, neurons are nerve cells. So for IGCC biology, you need to know about the three types of neurons. There's the motor neuron, there's the relay neuron, and there's the sensory neuron. So we, you need to know about the structure and the basic function of it, okay? So there's the motor neuron, and this is what it looks like. It has a cell body at one end of the, the cell, and then the length of it is covered in, it's insulated by uh, the myelin sheath, and then there's nerve endings the other end of it, okay? And then if you'll notice, you'll see some gaps between the myelin sheath that is, um, and you, oops, yeah, you'll notice the, the length of this cell itself. That is the axon or the nerve fiber. Uh, however, you need to learn the word axon, okay? And at the cell body, you'll notice some fingerlings, okay, extending out of it. Those are the dendrites. And these basically connect with other neurons, okay? And if you'll notice the direction of impulse, it goes from the cell body to the other end with the nerve endings. Okay, so this is the motor neuron. And then this is the sensory neuron. Now the difference here is you'll notice the cell body is smaller and it's in the middle of the cell. And then you have dendrites in one end and you have the axon terminal at the other end. And you'll notice the axon is here too. This, yeah, this is the sensory neuron basically. And then you've got the relay neuron, if you'll notice, it's much more branched out. It's the, the, the length of it is 
covered in synaptic endings and you've got the cell body at one end once again the cell body has dendrites and you'll notice that the axon is shorter here so you need to know the three you need to be able to visually identify and differentiate between these neurons so the relay neuron is shorter it's more branched out cell body at the end of it and then you've got the sensory neuron the cell body in the center and then you've got the motor neuron with the cell body in the center, uh, in, the, in the end, and a myelin sheath, okay? So these are the features that distinguish the three types of cells, all right? Now we look at the reflex arc, okay? The reflex arc is how your body automatically, like, okay, first of all, you need to the, the definition the reflex action is the means of automatically and rapidly integrating and coordinating stimuli with the responses of effectors so what is stimuli anything in the environment a change in environment for example a change in temperature or if you uh, prick your finger with a pin and then what are effectors effectors are parts of your body that react to it so if you're if it's hot your sweat glands release uh sweat so that's the effector in that case. Or if you touch a pin with your finger, your arm contracts. So the muscles in your arms are the effectors in this case, right? Okay. So remember we discussed involuntary actions. So a reflex action is an involuntary action. It is quick. Uh, it is quick to respond to a stimulus in order to order uh, in order to protect your body from danger so okay you're boiling something and you touch the pot on accident before you realize you, you've you've touched something really really hard your fingers already moved away from it you've jer jerked away from it okay and then you realize oh okay that's what's happening that's what's happening so what's happening here is before you can even think about it the signal doesn't really reach your brain it the response is immediate so that's what the reflex um, arc is so yeah that's the example they gave here removing your hand from a really hot metal surface and this action involves the three types of neurons the sensory neuron the relay neuron and the motor neuron you need to know is of that of the synapse the gap between neurons is called the synapse so not all neurons are actually touching okay there are neurotransmitters that transmit the messages so this gap between the neurons are called the synapse okay now we look at the simple reflex arc so this is something you need to memorize because this could they could ask you in detail as a four mark or so question or they could give you like a table as in a flow chart with boxes and some of the boxes will be filled with some of the information and the other boxes you'll have to fill so it really depends how your exam is but yeah so this is something you need to know from top to bottom so it starts with the stimulus affecting a receptor so what is a receptor a receptor is a cell or an organ that converts a stimulus into an electrical impulse okay so it's safer if you learn the definition of receptors and then the next step is that the sensory neuron carries impulse from the receptor to the CNS, that is the central nervous system, okay? Then there are relay neurons at the CNS that carries the impulse slowly because it has no myelin sheath. So that's the function of the myelin sheath. It basically speeds up the rate of impulse, uh, the impulse transfer. However, since the relay neuron has no impulse, it's, uh, it moves a bit slowly across the spinal cord. And then from the relay neuron, it the impulse moves to the motor neuron. And it, that carries the impulse from the central nervous system to the effector. Effector, once again, is the organ that's reacting to the stimulus. All right? So effector, either a muscle or a gland, carries out the response. So um, we will look at some of the examples of uh, the of a simple reflex arc coming up. And we'll also look at examples of effectors and how they work, like how your body reacts to change in temperature or change in blood glucose concentrations. So this is a diagram to explain what I just said. So if you look at the right top right of the image, 
you'll see the stimulus affecting the uh, stimulating the receptor and then the impulse is carried by the sensory neurons to the central nervous system where it is carried by the impulse is carried by this relay neurons to the motor neurons which then triggers the effectors to react or to respond to the stimulus okay and then okay this is about synapses again this is a bit this is the supplement part of it. So once again, this is a better different definition here. A synapse is the junction between two neurons consisting of a gap across the impulse, across which impulses pass by diffusion of neurotransmitters. The synaptic cleft is the small gap between each pair of neurons. And uh, this is, okay, yeah. so inside the neurons axon, that's the end of it. Remember the thing, the, the wire that we were talking about? The, the, across the length of the neuron, there are hundreds of tiny vacuoles. The, these are vesicles that contain a chemical called neurotransmitters. And the function of the synapse is that it ensures the impulses travel only in one direction. So when, so, so that there's no backflow, it's not the correct word, but that's how you can understand it. There's a backflow of the impulses. The impulse keeps moving in the in one direction, and it completes the entire cycle that it needs to. All right? And then this is the events at a synapse. So over here, you look at what the neurotransmitter is and what the vesicles are. So when an impulse arrives at a neuron, the vesicles move to the cell membrane and empty their content into a synaptic cleft. Vesicles are basically tiny sacs containing uh, chemicals. That's what they mean by the, the, the content part. So these vesicles move to the cell membrane and empty their content into the synaptic cleft. Once again, that's the gap, the junction between two neurons. The neurotransmitter is what's carried by the vesicles. The neurotransmitter quickly diffuses across the synapse and attaches to the receptor molecule in the next neuron. So in this case, it's the relay neuron. And this can happen because the shape of the neurotransmitter molecules is complementary to the shape of the receptor molecule. So I want you to think back to enzymes and how substrate and the active side of the enzymes work. This is some. This is a similar mechanism to that. Okay. Now, what, what you need to know is you need to know that you need to be able to discuss this. You need to be able to describe this process. It could come for three or four marks in the exam, and you, it's a paper four question and. If you're lucky if this comes because this is actually very easy marks. This is something you memorize and you dump on your paper. Yeah. And then you uh, you need to know how drugs can affect the function of the synapse. Basically, drugs act upon synapses by uh, preventing these neurotransmitters from diffusing across the synapse. And so it can make you feel less pain. So the, the main function of these neurotransmitters is for you to feel pain and so that you can detect any change in environment. So these some drugs like heroin can prevent that from happening. OK. And that's about that. Now we have coordination and response. That's this, this is the second part where we discuss about the sense organs. So over here, we define sense organs. We identify parts of the eye the eye is a very big part here and then over here we have the pupil reflex and we talk about accommodation accommodation is a process that's happening in your eye and we look at some of the functions of the parts of the eye okay so first of all you need to know that sense organs are groups of receptor cells that respond to specific stimuli what are stimuli and it's change in the environment like light sound touch temperature and chemicals okay so your body is equipped with like a lots of uh, mechanisms, lots of organs that are responsible for responding to these changes in environment. And that's what some of you are going to look at some of these here. So this is the eye, a, a side cross section of the eye. You need to be able to identify these parts. So what we are looking at are these specific parts. So you need to know about the cornea, the iris, the lens, retina, and, and the optic nerve. So the cornea reflects, refracts light, okay? So if you, you need to be very careful when you're saying reflect and when you're saying refract. 
in IGCC biology. I think pretty sure that's the same case in IGCC physics. So make sure you're not confusing those two words, the cornea refract light. So this, the cornea is the top clear layer, the first layer in your eye. And not sure if you can make it out over here, but this is the first layer and it's clear, you can see it. So you need to be able to identify this on the diagrams. And then there's the iris. Iris is, is the part of the eye that controls how much light enters the pupil. So th that is basically the colored part of your eye. If you can see it here surrounding the lens, okay, on the top of the lens, and how there's a gap between the two parts of the iris, that's, that gap is the, the pupil, okay? So the pupil is the part of the eye from which the light enters, okay? And then there's the lens. The lens can become thicker or thinner depending on how the light is focused is supposed to be focused onto the retina and then the retina is the part of the eye that contains light receptors like rods and cones and they are sensitive to light and different colors so this is these the rods and cones that you have in the retina is why you are able to identify and detect the different colors that you see okay so the retina is at the back of the eye. The other parts that we've looked at, like the cornea, iris, and lens are in the big in the front. You don't know, you don't need to know much about the other parts of the eye. You need to know about suspensory ligaments and the and the ciliary muscles. However, you won't be required to identify them in diagrams. You need to know about the fovea. Fovea is where most of the light receptors are concentrated. Uh, and then you need to know about the optic nerve. Optic nerve, you'll see, is the part that's extending out of the eye. And that is the part that carries impulses to the brain and, you know, carries information of what you're seeing to the brain so you're able to see what you're seeing. Okay? Now we have the pupil reflex. So if you'll notice how when you shine bright, you're in a bright room or if you're shining light into your eyes, your pupils get smaller. Or when you're in a dark room, your pupils get bigger so that more light is entering your eye and more you're, you're able to see things in the dark. So this process, this action that your eyes have, the, your pupils, is called the pupil reflex. And the function of the pupil reflex is to adjust your eyes for high or low light intensity. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So when the light intensity is low, your radial muscles so these are the circle parts <coughs> sorry the, the the straight lines that those lines those are the muscles that contract to become shorter so they're basically pulling the pupil to become bigger and so it's the diameter increases and the pupil becomes wider so that more light enters and a clear image is formed so once again, when it's low light intensity, the radial muscles, that is the straight lines, they contract and the circular muscles relax. Radial muscles contract and circular muscles relax. This could easily be a two to four mark question in paper four. So this is something you need to know. When light intensity is low, radial muscles, and in this diagram for your ease, they've differentiated this radial and the circular muscles based on the circles and the straight lines. So the radial muscles are the straight lines. Those muscles contract so that the diameter of the pupil increases and more light can enter so you can form a clear image on the retina. When the light intensity is high, however, the circular muscles contract. That's the circles on that pupil you see. Those circular muscles contract and become shorter to reduce the size of the pupil to protect the retina from bleaching so i don't know if you've noticed but when you look at something really really bright for really really long you'll notice white spots in the eye so that's basically what's happening there okay so when light intensity is high circular muscles contract radial muscles relax when light intensity is low radial muscles contract and circular muscles relax so these are just the two things you need to know for this part of the syllabus and then you need to know about the antagonistic muscles. So this is when a muscle opposes the action of another muscle. So for example, when you're flexing your biceps, your 
uh, biceps and triceps are antagonistic. So your biceps are contracting and your triceps are relaxing. However, when your arms are straight, your triceps are contracting and your biceps are relaxing. Uh, so that's one example of that. And the other example is the radial and circular muscles in the eye. So when it's one contracting, the other one's relaxing and vice versa. So yeah, that's, that's basically it, okay? Um, that's the antagonistic muscles. Now you have accommodation. Accommodation is the function in your eye where it adjusts for seeing near and distant objects. So when you're looking at a near object, the ciliary muscles contract. So I'm not sure if you've noticed the ciliary muscles. However, it is bordering the lens at the top at the bottom. So the ciliary muscles, they contract when you're looking at a near object and the ligaments relax, that's the suspensory ligaments, and your length becomes shorter and fatter, okay? So it becomes more rounded, like this, okay? So if you've forgotten this in the exam, this is a tip I've learned from my teacher. You should. What you should do is put your hand near your eye and try to focus on that, and you'll feel the strain in your eye. So that should remind you about how the ciliary muscles are contracting, all right? So near object, the when you're looking at something that's near, your lengths are becoming shorter and fatter. However, when you're looking at a distant object, the ciliary muscles relax and the ligaments, the suspensory ligaments tighten or contract, okay? And then the lens becomes thinner and longer. So you can, the diagram here shows how the dif how differently the light reflect, refracts when the lens is fatter and when the lens is thinner. So that is basically how um, your light accommodates itself in order to refract the light so that you can see, see an object from a particular distance, okay? Now you have the rods and cones. These are the light receptor cells. So first, like I said, you need to know about the fovea, which is the part of the retina where the receptor cells are pushed more closely together. So they are concentrated there. And... <clears throat> and you don't know about the functions of the rods and the cones. So the rods provide low detail black and white images, and they are most useful for seeing things in low intense, low light intensity. So that is at night, and that is what helps you see it in the dark, you know. And the rods are packed most tightly around the edge of the retina, where so you can see the things most clearly when not looking directly at them. Okay, so over here, what you need to know most importantly is that rods are useful for seeing things in low light intensity, and they provide low detail black and white images. The cones, on the other hand, provide detailed colorful images, and they work in high light intensity. So the cones are part of, are the light receptors that are that enable you to distinguish colors, and they are most pa tightly packed at the center of the retina, so they so that the objects are seen most clearly when they're being directly looked at. Okay, uh, not sure why this one's here again. Okay, so once again, this is a look, take a look at the eye. You need to know about the iris, the cornea, the lens, and the pupil, and the ciliary and list suspensory ligaments. However, you won't be able to, you won't be required to identify the ciliary and suspensory ligaments in diagrams. And then you also need to know where the retina and the fovea are and the optic nerve. The op but the optic nerve shouldn't be a hurdle to look for in the diagram because, because of how obviously it's protruding out of the structure. Okay, and then we've come at the third part of the chapter, that's the hormones. So over here, you need to know, you need to be able to define a hormone. You need to know about the different places where the hormonal glands secrete hormones. You need to know about the functions of some of the hormones that we have. And yeah, that's, that's basically it. Okay, so, First of all, first things first, you need to know the definition of hormones. So a hormone is a chemical substance produced by a gland and carried by the blood. So if you remember, blood, blood is the transport um, fluid in our body, the main transport fluid in our body, and this is where the hormone travels. And hormones are produced in the gland, traveled by the, carried in the blood, which alters the effect activity of one or more specific target organs. This is something you need to know word for word, because this could come as a come for a two mark definition question. And then you need to know where the hormones are secreted 
where they're formed and where what's their functions. So we'll start with adrenaline. I'm sure you've heard of this one. The adrenal, adrenaline is produced in the adrenal gland, which is right above your kidneys. And the function of this hormone is to prepare your body for vigorous action. Or just when you're in an exciting situation, when you need to be in a fight or flight, when you're in a fight or flight situation. So for example, when you're going on a roller coaster, you feel your heart pounding, you feel a bit lightheaded. So these are all effects of the adrenaline. And you know it's preparing your body for vigorous action so that it gets your heart pumping so that there's more blood flow all over your body. We'll look at this more into detail when we're in the coming slides because the syllabus requires you to know more about adrenaline. And then you need to know about insulin. This also we'll look into more detail in the coming slides. The insulin is produced in the pancreas and it reduces the concentration of glucose in the blood. And then you need to know about the testosterone and the estrogen. Testosterone is produced in the testes and it causes the development of male sexual characteristics. So these are hormones that kick in when males are undergoing puberty. And then you've got the estrogen, which is produced in the ovaries. And this causes development of female sexual characteristics. And these hormones kick in when females are going through uh, puberty. So this is about adrenaline. It is a hormone secreted by the adrenal gland. It increases the pulse rate and makes glycogen in muscle converted to glucose. You have so that there's more glucose for your cells to break down and release energy. And then you're breathing more deeper and more rapidly and your airways become wider and your skin becomes pale as the blood is diverted away into, into, more, into areas more likely to be used, such as your muscles. And then that's, yeah, that, that's the, basically it. For this hormone, you need to know the effects of it when it's in your bloodstream. So yeah, you need to know about how your pulse rate increases, how the glycogen in your muscles is converted to glucose, how you breathe more rapidly, how blood is diverted from some areas to other areas so that you're more useful. For example, if you need to be in combat or if you need to, you know, if you need to uh, have if you have any physical activities to do so adrenaline is secreted for example while bungee jumping or riding a roller coaster like i said okay and then you've got the nervous and the hormonal systems so a lot of people confuse these two they are not the same you need to know about the difference uh, between the two for this course okay so we have a few factors of comparison. We've got the speed of action, the nature of messages, the duration of response, the area of response. And yeah, that's basically it. And we look at some examples. So for the speed of action in nervous system, it's very, very quick, much, much quicker than, it's so quick you cannot even process it by the time it's done, okay? But the endocrine system, that is the hormonal system, this is a name you need to know, by the way, the endocrine system, speed of action is quite slow. It could take minutes to days, okay, depending on what exactly is happening, all right? And then the nature of message in the nervous system is electrical impulses which travel along nerves. However, in the endocrine system, it's a chemical messenger. Hormones are chemical messengers that travel in the bloodstream. And then the duration of the response in the nervous system, the speed of action is fast. However, the duration is also much, much faster than it is in the endocrine system. In the endocrine system, the duration or the effects of the hormones can last for years, for example, in puberty. And then the area of response in the nervous system, it's a localized area, okay? It's just the area, the, the target area. However, in the endocrine system, it is a widespread response. It, it, like the effect of the hormone can be felt in many different organs. So an example of the nervous system uh, in action is the reflexes such as blinking. So if you if someone's putting their finger too close to your eye, you're going to blink immediately. That is the effect of the nervous system. However, in the endocrine system, an example is the development of the reproductive system. Okay, so in this part, we're looking at homeostasis. So we've covered three parts. And I think there's about two more left. So right now we're looking at homeostasis. We're gonna look at what exactly is homeostasis. We're gonna look at the, uh, we've discussed how 
adrenaline works, but we haven't discussed how insulin works. That's something we're going to look at in this part of it. And we're going to look at how your body adapts to the, diff the temperature fluctuations in the environment and how a constant environment is maintained inside your body. Okay, so first things first, homeostasis is the maintenance of constant internal environment. Home and insulin decreases blood glucose concentration. This is something we already discussed. <clears throat> and in this chapter, in this part of the chapter, we're also going to look at glucagon. So this is a hormone that is also produced in the pancreas. And let's get into it. So we'll start with the negative feedback. Feedback controls the production of hormones. The hormones regulate their own production. So how this works is when the concentration of one of the hormones increases, it causes one of them to decrease or vice versa. So that's basically what they mean in this line. Okay. And then a negative feedback control is when the change in hormone level acts as a signal to cancel out that change. So like I just said, when one of them increases, the other one decreases, or when one of them reaches a certain level, it indicates another hormone to be, de uh, to be secreted that causes the initial hormone levels to fall. Okay, so the, it's kind of like a balance here, okay, and the hormone themselves control their own production, regulate their own production, how much and what concentrations they should be found in our bloodstream, okay. Uh, so that is the negative feedback. We will look at um, an example of it here in glucoregulation. So blood glucose levels is something that's very important and a vital factor in how healthy we are. So blood glucose levels are monitored and controlled by the pancreas. That's why we have insulin and glucagon produced in the pancreas. The pancreas produces and releases different hormones depending on the blood glucose level. Insulin is released when blood glucose levels are high. So when your blood glucose levels are too high, a hormone called insulin is produced. What insulin does is it stores excess glucose as glycogen in your cells, in the liver, okay? The glucagon, however, has the exact opposite effect. So when your blood glucose levels are too low, the liver, the cells in the liver can convert stored glucagon, glycogen, my bad, into glucose and releases it into the blood, releases it into the blood. So don't mis make the mistake I just made, made. A lot of people, they confuse glucagon and glyco glycogen. So you need to take extra, extra, extra care when you're writing answers from this part of the topic, because it's extremely easy to confuse the two. And sometimes you won't even realize what you've done until after you've received the paper and you're like, what did I do? You know, so glucagon is the hormone and sorry. Yeah, glucagon is the hormone and glycogen is the sugar. All right. So glycogen is the polysaccharide well, that is when glucose is converted to glycogen to be stored in the liver, okay? So when there's too much uh, glucose in your blood, insulin is released to convert glucose into the glycogen and stored in your blood. And when there's too little glucose in your blood, the exact opposite happens. Gl glucagon is released to convert glycogen into glucose and release it back into the blood for, you know, being streamed around the body. So this is a diagram, a uh, diagrammatic um, representation of what I just said. So you start at normal blood glucose levels. And when it's too high, there's the insulin released and the, the conversion of glucose into glycogen and all that, yada, yada, yada. And then you've got when the blood glucose levels are too low. And then <clears throat> you've got the secretion of glucagon and the conversion of glycogen into glucose and yada, yada, yada. All right. So this diagram is actually quite useful. This is something I would take a second look at. Um, and yeah, feel free to take a screenshot or whatever, because sometimes if you are not able to describe your answer in words, diagrams like these actually do help. OK, because you what at the end of the day, what you want is to get the message across to the examiner. I know what I'm writing and this is what I'm writing. You know? So this process, OK is glucoregulation and when glucoregulation doesn't work in a person that person is said to have diabetes so in for this syllabus for, for GCC biology type you need to know about type 1 diabetes and 
type 1 diabetes is caused by the death of cells that secrete insulin and the symptoms of this is hyperglycemia that is feeling unwell having constantly constantly having dry mouth blurred vision feeling thirsty or hypoglycemia that is when you're tired you're showing confusion and irrational behavior and the treatment for this is eating little and often so so you know when normally people have three big meals throughout the day but when you're diabetic it's better to have little little meals often throughout the day you know so you need to avoid large amounts of carbohydrates at one go and these patients often need to inject insulin into their blood stream since they're able to produce their own to reduce the blood glucose concentrations okay and then after glucoregulation we have thermoregulation this is when this is when the your body is responding to the changing temperatures okay so th there's first of all for this part of the chapter you need for this part of the chapter yeah <laughs> you need to know about the different parts of the the different layers in the skin and different things you can find here so the first layer is the epidermis then you've got the papillary dermis, then you've got the reticular dermis. This is not something you need to know into, in detail. What you do need to know into detail is about the oil glands, the nerve, the nerves, the blood vessels, that's the capillaries. So, you know, when you're feeling hot, your cheeks get red. That's the capillaries increasing the blood flow in your cheeks. That's something we look at later. And then the hair follicles and then the sweat glands and the muscles, obviously, on your skin that's you know controlling like uh, when you're frowning when you're smiling the muscles here so let's get right into it you have insulation provided by the fatty ish tissues that retain heat and you also have hairs on your skin that become erect to trap warm hair by contracting the erector muscles and vice versa so if you'll notice right under the ha hair follicle are the erector muscles this is not something that's specified by the diagram but you should notice that and you also have sweating that is a mechanism in your body where the water evaporates giving a cooling effect so when there's when there's sweat on your body they what they are evaporating and in order to evaporate they absorb heat energy from the neighboring skin in order to in order for it to evaporate you know and then there's receptors in your skin that sense heat and the, oops. <laughs> okay. And okay. And then you've got skin receptors that sense heat and the sensory neurons send impulses to the hypothalamus. That's the part of the brain that's, you know, responding, um, sensing and responding to the changes in temperature. And you've got shivering. This is when your skeletal muscles are mm, you're shivering, so you're generating action so that the muscular activity generates heat in your body, you know? And then you've got the other part of thermoregulation. This is the vasodilation and the vasoconstriction. So like I said, remember when I said your cheeks get hot when it's hot, or your cheeks get red when it's hot? So that is because of vasodilation. When it is hot, the arterioles, that is the capillaries that supply blood to the skin surface capillaries. Uh, yeah. And it's these arterioles, they dilate. So that means they become wider to allow more blood near the skin surface to increase heat loss. And that's why your skin, your face gets redder. And vasoconstriction is when it is hot, when it is cold, the exact opposite happens. So the arterioles, which is supplying blood to the skin surface capillaries, they constrict. That means the, the diameter decreases to allow less blood near to the skin surface to decrease heat loss. So if you remember from the transport in mammals chapter, your blood is also carrying heat energy with them, right? So when it's hot, you want them near the surface so that the, the heat energy is escaping. Okay, so you have heat loss. However, when it's cold, you don't want that. So there's the that's why the um, blood supply near to the surface, skin surface decreases. 
And this is also a diagram like the one we saw in local regulation. This, this is something, once again, I'll take a second look at and maybe take a screenshot of it, refer to it before your exams, because it really gives a summarized version of everything I just said. Okay. And now we have tropic responses and i think after that we are done with the chapter so in this part of the chapter we have you know different uh, responses in plants so there's gravitropism phototropism and we need to talk about how they work and how plant hormones can be used how plant hormones are used in plant growth and as weed killers okay so we start with gravitropism. Gravitropism is a response in which parts of a plant grows towards or away from gravity. So positive, what this means is that gravitrop gravitropism is the response that's uh, in relation to the gravity, basically. So a positive gravitropism is when growth is downwards. So think of it as towards the gravity, toward like, in accordance to the direction of gravity and negative gravitropism would be upwards that is opposite to the direction of the grav in which the gravity is working you know so auxins they tend to settle auxins are hot plant hormones and they tend to settle at the bottom end of the root however this does not make the cell tip of the plant root grow longer auxins prevent cells at the bottom tip for, of root from growing making cells at top of the root grow fast, faster. So when the cells at the top of the root grow faster, they push the root deeper into the soil and the root gets longer so that it's you know reaching the water bodies and maybe more nutritional area or just you know having better support so that when it's a bigger plant, it's not easy to topple over. So the last line says the root grows in direction of the gravitational pull. So that's basically what I meant by positive gravi gravitropism. So plant roots show positive gravitropism just because they grow in the direction of the gravitational pull, okay? And negative gravitropism would be in the plant shoots. That's the leaf part of the plant. You know, they're, go they're growing away from the direction of the gravitational pull. So that is what we look at in phototropism. Phototropism is a response in which parts of a plant grow towards or away from the direction of the light source. So... If sun sh shines on the right side of a plant's shoot, the auxins will accumulate on the dark opposite left side. So that when the plants, when the auxins accumulating in on one side, it's the cell, it's causing cell elongation in the right side of the shoot. Okay. So the auxin accumulating makes cells on the left side grow faster than on, than on the right side. And this causes the left side of the shoot growing faster than the right side. And then because of that accumulation of oxygen and, and because the left side is growing faster, the plant grows in the direction of the left side. So when it grows, the shoot starts to bend towards the right, towards the sunlight. Okay. So in this case, positive phototropism would be when the plant grows towards the sunlight and negative phototropism would be when the plant grows away from the sunlight. So in if you want to connect this one and the previous part, the gravitropism, it's the part of the plant which shows positive phototropism shows negative gravitropism. And the part of the plant which shows positive gravitropism shows negative phototropism. And okay, like we said, we're discussing weed killers here. So hormones can be used as weed killers, spraying plants with high concentration of hormones. Uh, and in this specification, you need to know about the 2,4-D hormone, the weed killer. It upsets normal growth patterns. It affects different species differently. So it might only kill one species and not the other. So the, we take advantage of this fact and we use it to kill only or, uh, only the weeds and not the actual plants we want, you know? And how these um, weed killers work, how these hormones work as weed killers is they accelerate the growth process so much that the plants grow at a rate in which it cannot sustain. So it does not have enough um, nutrition, sunlight, or water to sustain the rate of its growth. So it ends up, these plants end up dying afterwards. Um, and I, yeah, that, that that's it. So we have a few questions. Uh, this is 
May, June, 2012, paper one, variant two, question 25. The diagram shows the bones and the muscles of the upper arm. What must happen for the bones in the lower arm to move in the direction of the arrow? So you've got A, muscle X contra, oops. What's going on here? Okay. Uh, the What must happen for the bones in the lower arm to move in the direction of the arrow? So you've got X, that's the biceps, and Y, that's the triceps, and you want the lower arm to move upwards. Okay, so you're, once again, flexing your arms. So option A is muscle X contracts and muscle Y contracts. That's not possible because if you remember, biceps and triceps are antagonistic muscles. So when one contracts, the other has to relax. So A is not an option. Muscle Option B, muscle X contracts and muscle Y relaxes. Okay, you've got the antagonistic action going on here. Muscle X contracts and muscle Y relaxes. That does sound about right. I think that's the correct answer. But let's look at the other options because that's what you should always do. Option C, muscle X relaxes and muscle Y contracts. Uh, that is not true. And muscle D, once again, it does not show antagonistic action. Both of them have the same action, relaxing, relaxing. That's simply not possible. So in this case, the correct answer is B. Okay, the next question, May, June 2012, question 24. The diagram shows a section through the human eye. Which labeled part of the eye prevents the internal reflection of light in the eye? So that would be option A, the lens. And okay, that's that's about it. That is chapter 14. So thank you for watching. And I hope the video was helpful.